part of what I wanted to introduce at the beginning is our misperceptions. We're all really affected by what we see. We were just talking about what we see on TV and movies, and we see it in advertising. We see it all over the place. We think that there's something wrong with us if our life isn't like an episode of Friends. So we tend to think there's something wrong about our life because it's not as connected. We don't have a vibrant system of friendships, maybe, or our friends are difficult. We have to work at staying connected with them. So we tend to think that that everyone else's life is like a certain thing, and it's actually probably not. This seems like it's a little bit more close to reality. We get on these Zoom calls, and whether it's in person or in Zoom, this is just a good example. We don't know what people are thinking, and we don't know what people's experience is in that moment. There could be a lot of real angst around a personal situation that's going on. Somebody might be worried about someone that they love who's struggling with an addiction, or people are worried about their jobs or their finances, or People are grieving over a loss. So we don't really know. And then we have all of our personal things like, I look fat, I don't want to be on the screen, or just kind of praying that that person doesn't call on me, which is one of the reasons I don't call on people in this, in this group. I just don't want people to have that anxiety as well. And that people can have their cameras on or off. So we have this kind of conception based on our popular culture the people's lives are a certain way. And in actual fact, it's a lot more complicated than that. So if we look at shame as the root of social anxiety, I think this is such an interesting way to work with social anxiety. And it feels true. Helen Black Lewis was a, a really early shame researcher in the 70s, 80s in there. And she said that shame is one's own vicarious experiencing of the other's scorn. It's the self in the eyes of another. That's the focus of awareness and shame. So it's somebody else's judgment of us. And then we internalize it. Our gut experience is that we're, we're internalizing someone else's scorn for us. So that makes it really a lot more clear, I think, in, in terms of looking at a social environment, whether it's work or friends or going to the grocery store or whatever it is. So the threat then becomes, I might be taking a risk because I don't know if they're going to be okay with me. If I'm wearing a mask or not wearing a mask at the grocery store, I could be scorned in most areas now that it's tipping into if you're wearing a mask, you're part of the socially approved group. But we take these risks all the time. And somebody might look at us and, and make a judgment around our hair or our weight or our age or their perception of our intelligence. There's so many ways that we could be scorned. That makes it feel unsafe for us. And to me, it helped me to just kind of look at it from that lens, that it becomes a threat because we're taking the risk that we could be scorned. So anytime we speak up in a crowd, anytime we do public speaking, there's a lot of different environments where we're going to feel like that's a risk. And then we internalize that. So we feel bad because of the threat. So the threat makes us feel bad. And then we go from there to there's something wrong with me that I feel bad. And then from there we go into I am bad. And it's like so much of what we're talking about, we have the superhighway that develops in our neural connections for shame. And if we have a lot of criticism when we're a child, if our parents were really critical in particular, then we're going to have that feeling of I'm not good enough, I'm broken, I can never get it right. And that experience of traumatic shame really becomes central to our personality. And then it feels like it's not safe for me to to reach out to somebody. And then on top of that, of course, we add on exactly our experiences of being scorned or judged. Most of us, I'm sure all of us have had those experiences where 
we've been vulnerable with somebody and they've hurt us or a relationship that's that's uh, faltered and then we internalize the shame about that and so then another element of this is that we feel ashamed of feeling shame so this relates back to the first slide of why can't i enjoy this gathering like everyone else well actually probably not everyone else is enjoying it there's a lot of people that are kind of standing there with their hearts pounding and a kind of a fake smile on their face and just trying to trying to not be a target and so some people actually do enjoy getting together and i know for myself if i feel like i have a place a function if i feel like it's less likely that something's going to happen that's shaming i'm a lot more relaxed and i'm sure that's the case for all of us so we feel ashamed that we're feeling a threat we internalize it that we're bad and we internalize the shame of i should be enjoying this and i'm not and then we also if we lash out or we hide out or however we cope with that shame we're ashamed of that and so it gets to be this kind of a big ball of shame and contraction and i can't take this risk and this is really difficult and like with any situation where there's shame involves self-compassion is definitely the antidote so that's being kind with ourselves having other kind people around us can really make a difference too but recognizing that this is a universal experience social anxiety shame feeling like being scorned is a threat that's built right into our survival system so this is something that we all experience in different ways and then how can we be kind connected supportive with ourselves so i want to save most of our time here to work with the actual inquiry before we do that i just want to remind everybody about the tools so right now just to connect back into your body feel your feet on the floor your seat in the chair however you're sitting and then some of the really effective tools that we use all the time are tapping so if you feel like you're getting sucked back into something and you're losing your sense of this moment in time we always want to be staying in this moment in our own body. So use something like tapping on your forehead, looking at it with your eyes open with the image on the wall over there, focus shifting or tracing, kind of just looking at your fingers as you move them across in front of you. All of those things can help break the trance that's dragging us back. And then we come right back into this moment. We feel our body take a few breaths. And the six second exhalation always great to do the six second exhale you can do it with voo you can hum you can just talk in longer sentences if you're out with somebody but it's always helpful to let your own system have that longer exhalation if you're starting to get kind of ramped up let's go right into the inquiry the structure that we use and you're really free to modify that if you'd like is if you were to imagine that you're you're in the middle and on your right side is freedom on your left side is all of your conditioning our beliefs are conditioned by our experience so our experience is that when we're around other people sometimes we're going to get hurt and sometimes we might have a, a scornful look somebody might engage with us directly it's a risk when we go around other people and on the other side of our body, on the outside of our body, is this freedom. There's no shame. And there might even be a, a feeling of other people. It's exciting to be around other people because we get to connect and we get to express love and feel love. And so somewhere in the middle there is most of our experience. And the reverse inquiry that we look at these things is a way to say, I think there's something in here that I need to look at, but I'm not exactly sure about it all. So the statements are the reverse of what we, we believe. And then our ego and our mind comes forward and goes, yeah, that's not true. I'm not comfortable in social situations. And then we can sit with the energy in our body and, and look at that. Let's take a moment as you start to just notice your body and your breath. You get grounded in the present moment. Sometimes it's helpful to have a hand on the heart or on your belly just to kind of keep in touch with your breath and you know we're all really free to move in and move away peter levine calls that titrating we 
engage and when it's starting to feel uncomfortable or like we don't really, we're starting to lose our awareness of this moment, we might use tools like tapping or tracing. And we might also just kind of back away from it for a minute. We could get up and shake or use one of the other ways we have of letting that go. So what are your beliefs? I'll freeze and not know what to say is a common one. It could land on our core deficiency beliefs. If I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough. And another one in a social situation could be that people can feel my anxiety and they don't want me around. So you could work with one of those or you could just let it come forward. What are some of your your beliefs that are being conditioned by your experience? What comes up right now? And it might help to think of a specific thing like a family dinner or, you know, meeting with a group of friends or a Zoom call or something like that. Or even to use this as an example. Let's take a moment just to notice what are your conditioned beliefs around social engagement and social anxiety in particular. And if it works for you, you can kind of visualize them all kind of stacking over there on the left side. You might see words, images. It has an energy to it sometimes. I can often feel like a, it's like a sludgy swamp there over on the left. What is some of your conditioning around this? And then use that to come up with your own reverse inquiry or use one of these here. I don't care what they think. They meaning anybody who might shame us. Or my worth does not change with other people's judgments of me. And then we're listening for the rebuttal. Some part of you is going to tighten up as a contraction that you feel. Or words like, that is not true. Memories might come back. So let's take a, you know, three or four minutes to really kind of sit with this. Stay connected in your body. If you want to write it down or just kind of sit there with it, what comes up for you when you do a reverse inquiry? You might need to take a break to just kind of support yourself, be kind, acknowledge this is hard. We're talking about shame, which is really deeply felt. And this is an experience that many of us have. And stay with your breath, stay in your body. And if you're working with words or pictures, tapping can be really effective if it's starting to feel too intense. Otherwise, just stay with it and look. What's coming up here? We'll give it about another minute or so. And 
you could make a mental note or an, a physical note of things you might want to come back to. This isn't really long enough to do a complete inquiry. What's coming up that you that you might want to work with more? And then let that come to a close for now. And bring your attention back to that structure if that works for you. So the conditioned beliefs on the left. And on the right, this open space on the right, there's no shame. So this would be where we have healed enough that we're no longer shamed by other people. We no longer have that you know, critic or that habitual response of feeling shame, that we value ourselves and know ourselves and we're kind and attentive, connected. So it might be an aspirational situation for sure. Other people now are seen as an opportunity for connection and love. Stephen Porges talks about safety is the absence of threat plus a connection. So this would be one of the ways that that would look like. Other people are an opportunity for connection and love. And just imagine what that feels like over on the right-hand side of your body, the freedom of that, just the space. All of your conditioning is over on the left side. And right now we're just going to leave that behind. Really feel into that freedom. And then we're going to work with this dress rehearsal. But last week we focused more on going through this imagined event in slow motion, stopping when we feel anxious, staying aware of the body and breath. But this week I want to focus more on the visualization of it turning out really well. So see if you could keep a little more connected with that freedom of the right. No shame. Other people are an opportunity to connect, to express love, to feel love, to feel their love. And if that works for you, let's do a run through of something like that. So we walk into the gathering or the room and people's faces light up. I'm so happy you're here. I'm so happy to see you. Or when we come online with this group, we look around and or another group, we look around and we go, wow, I'm so happy to see this person. It's nice to feel connected and like a part of something. And really feel it in your body. Let your whole body be soft. The threat that we, you know, bring our ears up around our shoulders, without that threat, we can let our shoulders soften. Our neck can soften. Let your breath be easy, smooth, deep, continuous. And see yourself really engaged in conversation or in listening, talking. You feel really connected with yourself and with the others that are there with you, whether it's one or several. Just imagine that feeling of connection and let these images, use all your senses to let that come alive. What does it look like? You could back up and put yourself in the picture. If you say something kind of awkward, you recover quickly. They don't shame you or scorn you for that. It's just an awkward moment, and then you get right by it and back into connection. Really feel calm, grounded, and connected with yourself you're really familiar with how it feels you're breathing easily your body's relaxed you're engaged there's no threat here and you're confident that if any kind of 
little wrinkle comes in that you can handle that. But this is okay. You're safe here. What does that feel like in your body? And maybe some of the old programming comes in and you pause for a minute. Hmm. Where does that come from? Is there an early time I remember when I felt like that? What's the evidence that this is not safe right now? And we could take a moment to connect with that younger self. To reassure them that now in this moment, we're well resourced. We're not back in that situation where we were at somebody's mercy, where we had to kind of stay. Now we're an adult. We have other options. We have things we can say and do, and we have more power, more control. Let yourself feel that connection and then really come back into this moment again. Smooth breath, relaxed body. You're safe. It's safe to be connected and to engage. Feel back into the right side of the body where there's no shame. There's just freedom, no conditioning. Oftentimes our minds will bring things up and we could let them settle. We could be aware and work with them. We could just come back to presence, let your system settle. Take a few deeper breaths, soften anything that might have gotten activated. Let's take another minute or so, finish this dress rehearsal. What does it feel like in your system when your conditioning is calm? You've left it behind. It might still be kind of a potential trigger, but right now it's just over on the left. It's not causing any trouble. And bring your attention over to the right side. Feel the freedom and the space. And from here, visualize yourself connecting with other people. And it's going really well. And then when you're ready, let's come back to the group 